On June 5, 2014, a road worker stumbled upon two strange suitcases that had been discarded, one purple and one black. They were on the side of a highway in Geneva, Wisconsin, covered in flies and reeked of decomposition. Inside both suitcases were human remains. The first set was in a severe stage of decomposition and belonged to a female with her hands bound behind her back with rope. The other set of remains was less decomposed and belonged to a female with a rope wrapped around her neck and a ball gag in her mouth. This female was quickly matched by her tattoos and dental records and belonged to 37-year-old Laura Simonson, who had been reported as missing by a friend. The other set could not initially be identified and became a Jane Doe referred to as suitcase body. Laura was a single mom from Farmington, Minnesota. The friend had reported her missing because she told him she would be going to Wisconsin and gave him the passwords to her accounts. These passwords would help the police discover how these women lived a risky lifestyle that ultimately led to their deaths. One of the sites was a bondage meetup site for people interested in BDSM. An employee of the hotel she checked into recalled seeing her before the missing person case went public. He notified authorities, and footage from the hotel showed her checking in with an unknown man who paid cash for the room. That same man is in the footage carrying Laura's suitcase and belongings out of the hotel, the same suitcase that Laura's body was found in. Police created a digital rendering of the other victim's badly decomposed body. The image is very strange looking, but it was done to show defining features in hopes that someone would recognize her that way. Shockingly, the mother of a missing woman found the teeth in the image similar to her lost daughter, Jeannie Gomez. 25 days after being discovered, on June 28, 2014, with the use of dental records, the Jane Doe was officially identified as 19-year-old Jeannie Gomez. Jeannie had been missing since 2012 after she was last seen in Cottage Grove, Oregon. She had told her family she would be moving out of state, and so they never reported her missing. She was a college student and grew up in the foster system. She was estranged from her mother, and her father lived out of the country, and the pair rarely spoke. She was also not close to any other family members. She and Laura did not know one another, but would die in the same fashion by the same sick killer who used the name Mr. Handcuffs on the website. Their killer was eventually tracked down to his apartment where he lived in West Allis, Wisconsin. They discovered he had been a police officer in West Allis until his continued harassment of exotic dancers and prostitutes got him in trouble. He would quit the force and began working as a security guard in Milwaukee. He admitted to having been involved in BDSM for decades, but denied that he ever went through with meeting Laura in person and that it had just been fantasy talk online. He volunteered his DNA, which matched the DNA on the rope's knot wrapped around one of the women. He was no longer referred to as the Wisconsin suitcase murderer, but by his real name, Stephen Zelich. On the BDSM site where he called himself Mr. Handcuffs, his request was to have the absolute ownership of a 24-7 slave with which both Laura and Jeannie had been communicating. His car had been reported as leaking a foul odor in the parking lot of his employment, and his superiors told him to take care of it because his co-workers were complaining about the bad odor. That's when he dumped the suitcases that were causing the smell. He claimed that the women died during a bondage sex act and that he had to discard them and pleaded guilty to both women's murders. He said Jeannie agreed to fly from Oregon to Wisconsin to become his slave. He picked her up from the airport in Milwaukee and the pair drove to Kenosha to a Quality Inn hotel. While there, they engaged in breath play where he placed a rope around her neck to control her ability to breathe on and off. He said he accidentally held the rope too long at one point. He said he brought her to his home, removed her from the suitcase, and kept her body in his refrigerator for about a year. Then Laura was his next victim. 
before she came to his home, he had spent weeks instructing her on ways to hide her tracks of where she was going and how she could be found. He explained that her death was an accident as well. In 2016, Zelich was sentenced to 35 years for Jeannie's murder plus 10 years and 25 for Laura's murder. His former roommate came forward and told police that she had moved out after he confided in her that he had kept a girl hostage for seven years in a cage while he worked as a police officer. This sadist likely has more victims that we may never know about. At least now, he will spend the rest of his life behind bars. At the age of 14, Nicole Smith lived in the Deerfield Apartments in southwest Atlanta, Georgia. On June 7, 1995, as Nicole was walking to school, she realized she had left an assignment at home. So she turned around and took a shortcut near the apartments on Campbellton Road. She would then encounter a monster in the woods who would beat, rape, and fatally shoot her. Two security guards at the nearby apartment complex heard the gunshots and ran into the woods and discovered Nicole's body. Sadly, Nicole's mother, Aquanilia Smith, would also hear the gunshots, unaware that her daughter had just been murdered. An extensive investigation ensued, but after some time and no leads, the case would go cold for the next 26 years. In 2002, retired detective Vince Velasquez reopened the case on his own and would work on it for two long years without any leads. Then in June 2004, 13-year-old Betty Brown from East Point, Georgia, was preparing for Father's Day when a man lured her into the woods on Connolly Drive and attacked her. Thankfully, she survived the attack and was able to give investigators a description of the suspect, which helped create a sketch. The DNA from her attack matched the DNA of Nicole's attack. Her attack took place just three miles from where Nicole was murdered. Then 18 years later, in 2022, a DNA profile was developed from the DNA collected from the crime scene. Using genetic genealogy and ancestry websites, they were able to identify the coward that attacked Betty and killed Nicole as Kevin Arnold. However, it was quickly learned that he had died in Fulton County, the same county where both crimes took place. He died in August 2021 of liver and kidney failure in a hospice facility and would never face justice. With a nine-year difference between attacks, he likely committed other similar attacks during that time. Nicole's mother, said she never imagined her daughter's killer would be deceased and says she is left with so many unanswered questions. She also says that her killer being identified does not bring her closure and she will live with pain for the rest of her life. In April 1994, Hikers in Shingleton, California, stumbled upon skeletal human remains in the remote wooded area near Grace and Nora Lakes. Investigators determined the remains belonged to 19-year-old Frank McAllister, who was reported missing by his girlfriend, Danielle Taddock, about a year earlier on May 7, 1993. After being reported missing, her car that he borrowed was then found the next day in the parking lot of a Costco with a large amount of blood inside. Two months earlier, Frank had been in a car accident, and the day before he went missing, he received an insurance settlement check for about $4,500. He cashed the check and very quickly went missing. No arrests were made, and the case would go cold. Then, 25 years later, on January 9, 2018, a man went to his local news station, KRCR, and confessed to the crime. He said he would go to the sheriff's department next door and turn himself in. Brian Keith Hawkins had become a devout Christian and said he could no longer live with the guilt. He also implicated siblings Curtis Culver and Shauna Culver as his accomplices. Within hours, they were arrested. The three had been persons of interest over the years and were interviewed numerous times, but always denied any involvement. 
Hawkins told police that in 1993, they planned to rob Frank after they found out he planned to use the insurance money to buy a large amount of meth to mark up and resell. They lured him from Reading to Shingleton, where they said they knew people that would sell him large amounts of the drug. But instead of just robbing him, they killed him and left his body in the woods. They then drove the car back to Reading, where Hawkins abandoned it in the Costco parking lot. Little did Hawkins know that before he approached the Culvers with the idea, they had already made plans to murder Frank and take the money. The Culvers initially denied involvement, but eventually confessed to their part in the murder and were placed behind bars to await their sentencing, which was finally announced in early 2022. Hawkins was sentenced to 25 years to life, Curtis to 35 years, and Shauna received 20 years. They must serve 85% of their time before they are eligible for parole. Joy Ann Avil Hibbs was born September 23, 1955, and married Charles Hibbs in 1974. In 1991, at the age of 36, she lived at 1200 Spencer Drive in the Croydon section of Bristol Township, Pennsylvania, with her husband and two kids. She worked as a medical assistant and was described as a sweet, charming, southern girl and devoted mother. On April 19, 1991, Joy's 12-year-old son David came home from school and found the kitchen on fire with smoke pouring out of the windows. He screamed for help, knowing his mother was likely inside, and ran to a neighbor's home for help. After the fire was extinguished, Joy's body was found inside her son's bedroom. It was initially thought to be an accidental fire until the autopsy showed that she had been beaten, stabbed, and strangled with a cord before the fire was set. The electrical cord used to strangle her was found nearby in the charred remains. The fire marshal determined that the fires were intentionally set in the kitchen, the bedroom where Joy was found, and the hallway. Investigators later learned that Joy had cashed her paycheck hours before her death and her wallet was found stuffed in the couch. Her purse was also found with items emptied and strewn out in the kitchen, and her cash was missing. In addition, Around the estimated time of the attack, witnesses saw a blue Chevrolet Monte Carlo parked outside the Hibbs' home. A former neighbor, Robert Francis Atkins, owned a blue Monte Carlo and often sold marijuana to Joy's husband. Regardless, the case would go unsolved for the next 31 years. Atkins remained a person of interest for three decades. He had spoken with authorities twice over the years, telling them he was a confidential police informant working with the Bristol Township Police Department when Joy was killed. The former police chief, Thomas Mills, later confirmed that in 1991, Atkins was a drug dealer turned informant and had been working for them as a CI, purchasing meth and marijuana. Atkins also told investigators about a fight he had with Joy and her husband over the claims of low-quality marijuana, but denied threatening her or her family. But he was well known for having a violent temper. Joy had told her husband that Atkins threatened to blow up her home and kill her after the argument about weed quality. But there was never enough evidence to charge him for the crime until his ex-wife, no longer too afraid, came forward with information. She agreed to record phone conversations between her and Atkins. Finally, on May 25, 2022, it was announced that Atkins, who had been a longtime person of interest in the case, was arrested. Atkins was charged with first-degree murder, second-degree murder, two counts of robbery, and seven counts of arson. His ex-wife, April Atkins, testified that in the early afternoon of Joy's murder, he came home covered in blood. She said he told her he had stabbed someone and lit their house on fire. He then told her to call out of work and get their children because they were taking a trip to the Poconos. Joy's family, the DA, and the detectives never gave up and fought hard for justice, which they finally received after three long decades.
In May 1988, two children playing in San Francisco, California, saw something that caught their attention near a creek bed near the 18,000 block of Madison Avenue. It was a paper bag among some trees and bushes, and when the curious kids peeked inside, they made a horrific discovery. Inside was a deceased newborn baby boy. Authorities believed at the time he may have been born within the past two days. The baby was wrapped in a light blue t-shirt depicting the Garfield cat cartoon and the Taurus astrological sign. The autopsy showed that the infant was born alive and then strangled to death, likely with a ligature. The baby, John Doe, was given a 200-person funeral at St. Leander Church in San Leandro and posthumously named Richard Jason Terrence Rain after the church's vicars and priest. His true identity and the identity of his mother would go unknown for the next 32 years. Meanwhile, in 2005, DNA evidence collected where the newborn was found helped form a DNA profile which was entered into CODIS, but there were no matches. Later, using the DNA profile for genetic genealogy, the infant's mother was finally identified in 2020. Investigators then began surveillance on the woman until they could retrieve items from her trash that contained her DNA. The DNA was analyzed and matched to 52-year-old Lisa Lopez. She was then arrested at her home in Stanislaus County, California. She admitted that at age 20, she hid her pregnancy from her family and friends. In addition to murder, Lopez was also charged with using a ligature. But her attorney said she had grown into a loving, nurturing mother and grandmother. Lopez had been married for 25 years and has two grown sons and a two-year-old granddaughter. At her first court appearance, she pleaded not guilty. Any further details about the case have not been released to the public because the legal process is still ongoing.